The Sum of the Christian Life, Part 3, we're going to look at Romans 13, and we're going to wrap it up today. Today's mainly application. Uh, we've come to the part, make no provision for the flesh. And uh, so we'll be talking a lot about sanctification, practical stuff. Romans 13, 13, and 14. Let, but let us walk properly, as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, nor in strife, not in strife and envy. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Now, having carefully defined the meaning of flesh when it is used negatively of our remaining sin, Paul calls it a law of sin. Sometimes it's called the old man, the law of sin within us, the flesh, the sinful flesh, the remaining corruption. We need to examine what Paul means when he says, make no provision for the flesh in 14b. So that's our main, our whole topic today. The word provision, pra, not ya, comes from two words, pro, before, and no, eh oh, to think. The basic idea is that we must not think about, premeditate, or plan to fulfill sinful lusts. Don't plan for it. Starve it. We are rather to starve it so that it cannot have an influence over us. <coughs> and this is where we come to some practical applications regarding how we must not provide for the flesh. This obviously means that we must never plan for sin. You don't want to premeditate sin. That's, that's a, what the Bible calls a high-handed sin, like the Israelites were stiff-necked against God. <clears throat> and we must watch against anything that would bring us into temptation. So some applications of this principle are as follows. And this is very important. When you're trying not to sin, you have to watch against occasions to sin. Now, our first point, we must avoid communion, friendship, or covenant bonds with all unbelievers and all unrepentant, immoral, professing Christians. That is, you'll meet, and this is very common in the South, especially common in the South, where you meet Baptists and you meet Evangelicals, and they're fornicating and they're getting drunk just like everybody else, but they go to church and they sing some hymns. And they, they get dressed up and go to church and act pious for one day. But they're fornicating and they're living like a pagan. Paul says not even to eat with such a person. Here's what Paul says. Oh, I forgot to write it down. I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexual immoral people. Yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or idolaters since you would then need to go out of the world. But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a one. Now Paul is not saying that it is moral, wise, or good to hang out with rank heathen. He's not saying that. He is simply pointing out that Christians cannot live in the present world <coughs> without encountering unbelievers. And all, anybody who has a normal job, you're going to hang where you, where you go to work. Most of the people around you are unbelievers. I remember I was a security guard at a facility for rich people. And uh, the, the guys around me, all they talked about was pornography and sports, and they were all total whoremongers and partying and getting drunk. He makes himself clear in 2 Corinthians 6, 12 to 16. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial, another name for the devil? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. Now, a crucial part of making no provision for the flesh involves separation from the world. <clears throat> and that world sanctification basically means to be separate. You're sanctified. You're set apart. 
Set apart to what? Set apart from the world, set apart from sin, set apart from the devil to serve Christ. The unbeliever by nature is a walking, talking solicitor toward evil and sinful behavior. The unbeliever's life is centered on self and satisfying the sinful flesh. The believer's life is centered on Christ. The unbeliever lives for this present world and is part of the evil world system. His value system comes from below. The Christian's life is focused on heaven above. His values come from the throne of God. We have different priorities. We have different ethics. The unbeliever seeks the glory of man and thus lives to please and appease the crowd. The Christian seeks the glory of God and lives to please his precious Lord and Savior. That's a radical difference. Consequently, to make friends of the heathen and to commune or covenant with them is a deliberate placing ourselves in a situation of temptation. You're asking for trouble. You're placing yourselves in around people who are the enemies of God, who are easily controlled by the demonic world, who will they will use to try to destroy you. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, do not be deceived, evil, evil company corrupts good habits. The word translated company means companionship, literally a being together. Remember Samson, a man of faith, but he had some sin problems, liked to hang around with the Philistines, liked Philistines' women? What happened? He lusted after the Philistines' woman, and he got his eyes poked out. God judged him. Yes, he was a man of faith. Yes, he went to heaven. But he died young, and he didn't need to. He had no business hanging out with the Philistines when there were plenty of of Jewish women that he could have married. Fellowship with unbelievers is very dangerous. They must be avoided because evil thinking, words, and behavior is contagious. <coughs> it, is not, uh, it is not wrong to spend time witnessing to unbelievers and see seeking their conversion for Jesus, Paul, and the other apostles spoke to unregenerate sinners all the time. But being with unbelievers in order to speak the gospel is far different than associating with unbelievers as your friends and comrades. If one is doing a spiritual duty in the presence of pagans, then either the unbelievers will be converted to Christ or they're going to tell you to get lost. And that basically happened to me. I became a Christian. I witnessed to all my friends. A couple became professing Christians, and the rest didn't want to be around me at all. That guy's, a, that guy's a nut. He's giving up A, B, C, and D to be a Christian? He's nuts. In addition, when one associates with unbelievers to speak about Jesus Christ, one can expect the Holy Spirit to preserve them and keep them safe. This principle of separation from the ungodly was violated by the Israelites all the time. The history of the Israelites is a history of declension, disobedience, covenant breaking, and even apostasy. 722, the northern tribes were conquered by Assyria and carried off for their idolatry. 587, Judah was destroyed and God had mercy because of his covenant with David and they were brought back 70 years later. <clears throat> It resulted in intermarriage with the heathen. That was their great problem. Syncretism, that is the mixing of paganism with the true religion, where you don't have the true religion anymore. And if you read uh, Kings and Chronicles, you see that people were worshiping Baal and they were still going to the temple. It was a syncretistic religion. God warned Israel, saying, this is Deuteronomy 12, 29 to 30. When the Lord your God cuts off from before you the nations 
which you go to dispossess and you displace them and dwell in their land, take heed to yourself. Be careful. Watch what you're doing. That you are not ensnared to follow them after they are destroyed before you, and that you do not inquire after their God, saying, How do these nations serve their gods? I will do likewise. God warned Israel in advance, and they didn't obey. They didn't obey. The assumption behind these kind of passages is that communion with the heathen leads to temptation to incorporate aspects of their worldview, religion, and culture. It happens all the time. We see it in America. We see it with evangelicalism. They're obsessed with Hollywood and entertainment. Preaching becomes comedy and goofball stuff and nice stories. Worship becomes almost blasphemous. It's totally humanistic. Modernistic or liberal Christianity is a syncretism with secular humanism and its chief philosophies. Socialism, statism, and sexual immorality. They support the transgender movement. They support homosexuality. They support lesbianism. They have super lax views regarding adultery and fornication. The National Council of Churches supported communist revolutionaries in Angola that were murdering Christian missionaries. They're the enemies of God. They're secular humanists with religious language. Why would anyone bother to go to church is beyond me because they don't believe in the Christ of the Bible at all. They don't even believe he's God, and they don't believe in the resurrection. The state, in their view, and not Christ as Savior. And much of modern evangelicalism is a syncretism with our entertainment-obsessed and money-obsessed culture. Worship becomes humanistic and showy. And the preaching is focused on prosperity and living the good life now. It's not, hey, how can we serve Christ more effectively? How can we be holy? How can we obey the Ten Commandments and please God? How can we grow in grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ and learn solid Christian doctrine and grow? No, it's not about that at all. How can I have whiter teeth and a bigger car and a nicer house? How can I be more materialistic like my neighbors? That's what Joel Alstein and all these prosperity people are about. That it's not Christianity, that's American pagan culture which is obsessed with things, with money, keeping up with the Joneses. <clears throat> the influence of pagan or atheistic philosophy is the pathway to idolatry and disloyalty to Yahweh. We see evangelicals becoming soft on homosexuality and Christian ethics, and we even see some in reform circles becoming soft on things like divorce and homosexuality. If you commit adultery and you dump your wife, you're not allowed to get remarried. If you get remarried, you're committing adultery. That's what Jesus taught. That's not taught in a lot of reform circles now. The syncretism <clears throat> is a particular danger in the United States where all religions are treated the same and everyone seeks neutrality and common ground for the sake of the political and cultural order. So you have people like George W. Bush, who's a professing Christian. He's a Methodist, which is crapola. Uh, but basically committing idolatry, public idolatry, when they had the service with all the ecumenical people there. No. Islam and Judaism and the cults and Indian shamanism, these things are Buddhism, these things are not legitimate religions. They're, they're false. They're lies. They're demonic. As Israel was to seek a literal total obliteration of every aspect and dimension of the Canaanite culture and religion, we are called upon to separate ourselves from all modern forms of heathenism. heathenism. So if you're a professing Christian, you don't put your kids in the state school system. You don't put your kids in the public school system where they're indoctrinated in pro-sodomite rights and pro-socialism and pro-transgendered nonsense. How in the world can you send your children into the lion's den of satanic education and call yourself a Christian? How can you do that? Would you save in a little money? The flesh is naturally attracted to secular humanism because atheistic naturalism is founded on human autonomy, 
hey, I get to call the shots. I get to choose my own ethics. Which is the foundation of a life of sin <coughs> and self-centered living. To give room and time for such enemies of Christ is to deliberately expose yourself to temptation. Why would you do that? It better be hanging out with good, solid Christians who are going to challenge you to be a better Christian. You want people around you who are going to be examples to you. Boy, look at Bob, man. That guy getting up and he's reading his Bible and he's praying and he's doing this and he's doing that. i got to try to do better. Instead of hanging out with Tom over there who's uh, got the best weed in town and he's tempting you to go to the bar and pick up on chicks. Do not make provision for your flesh. Do not make provision for the sheltering, entertaining, and nurturing your soul's enemies. Don't give your time to soul-destroying, Christ-denying dogs, or you will be bitten and perhaps even ravaged spiritually. Look at the Israelites. Look what happened to them. They became worthless. And look at the church, the, the ancient church, how it incorporated Greek and pagan philosophy and all kinds of idolatry because that's what the people wanted. It was syncretism. Roman Catholicism is a syncretism with Greek philosophy and Roman paganism. Christmas and these holy days that were all pagan holy days. Even the outfits the popes wore. There's, you know, read Hislop's book in the, the, the Two Babylons. Roman Catholicism is full of paganism. That's syncretism. If you give the devil a seat at the table, you are providing for your uh, flesh. Do not make provision. Kill off the Canaanites through godly separation. Break their idols in pieces. Smash their sacred pillars. Throw down their altars. Burn to ashes their humanistic idols. This may sound anti-multicultural and non-pluralistic. And it certainly is. But this is what the Bible requires. All these people that secular humanists worship, JFK, Roosevelt, Martin Luther King, they were all satanic to the core. Martin Luther King was a habitual adulterer who embraced socialism. He did some good things. I'm sure JFK did some good things. But at bottom, they're secular humanists. They're dangerous. First Corinthians six seventeen, see Isaiah fifty two eleven. Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you, says the Lord Almighty. Come out from them. Separation. It's a requirement. The importance of not communing with the wicked is set forth dramatically in Psalm one one to two. Right in the beginning of the, the whole Psalter, God's book of worship, the hymnal for the church. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. <clears throat> this psalm is regarded by many scholars as a prologue or introduction to the whole Psalter. It tells us the way to be happy or blessed, how to experience covenant blessings. First, believers must not walk in the counsel of the wicked. They must not listen to unbelievers or the enemies of God or receive their advice. Don't listen to them. Why would you do that? A man who is faithful to God and his word will not pay any attention to the ideas or philosophies or ethics of wicked men. And I remember back when I was in seminary. It was over 40 years ago. And I did an intensive study of modernism or Christian liberalism. And basically, this guy followed Kant. This guy followed Hegel. This guy followed Schleiermacher. 
it's it, these guys are all following pagan philosophies and that's why it changes certain things it has in common it hates the word of god and it hates christ it hates god but they follow human philosophies the first verse describes wicked enemies of god in three different ways the three clauses are presented in an ascending climax if one listens to the unbeliever or the wicked man, then second, he will end up standing in the path of sinners. There's a progression. That is, those who miss the mark of God's law because they reject it. He'll hang out with them. He'll stand with them. By walking or shaping his conduct according to the ungodly, he ends up standing with sinners on their path of human autonomy and rebellion. <clears throat> so first he listens. Now, he's standing with them. They're comrades. They're hanging out. He's adopted their world and life view. The pagan manner of living becomes his manner of living. His commitments and priorities have shifted from covenantal obedience to pagan lawlessness. This process of apostasy does not happen all at once. But the professing Christian often slowly and almost imperceptibly has a shift in worldview and commitments. And you see this, you know, he stops going to prayer meeting. He stops, he starts missing church a lot. Then he stops going to church. And then you find out he's fornicating. You find out he's hanging out with unbelievers. And you find out he's abandoned the faith. I went to one guy's house who flaked out and he had, I, I looked in the garbage can. He had thrown away all his Christian books, including the Bible. That's apostasy. The third step indicates the final outcome of listening to and then taking one stand with a heathen. He sits in the seat of the scornful. He fully commits himself to men who reject the word of God and Jesus Christ and mock the truth. <clears throat> he becomes a scoffer. He not only rejects the Christian world and life view, but he openly mocks it. He derides it as wrong, foolish, stupid, and absurd. And you see, there's all these people on YouTube and all these people, wow, I used to be a Christian, now I promote atheism. It's super popular. And they do really well. And then, of course, you get Ricky Gervais and all these comedians and all these Hollywood people who you know, are proud atheists and they mock Christianity and they mock reli true religion. And they lump in with Islam and, and the cults and all these satanic lives. Birds of a feather flock together. Mockery and ridicule of that which is holy have often drawn men together in this unholy cause, this hatred of the king, this hatred of Christ. And we just sang Psalm 2. You either bow the knee and you give him homage, you worship him as king, as Lord, or you'll be destroyed. He takes his seat in the assembly of the wicked. By not focusing on God's holy law and by providing for his flesh, by keeping me company with those who reject Jesus Christ, he is now fully in league and fellowship with the wicked. He's apostate. There is no neutrality. If you don't love Christ, if you don't serve Christ, if you don't bow the knee to Christ and make him everything in your life, you'll become a hater of Christ. You'll become a blasphemer. You'll become a hater of the true and living God. And you're only... Uh, thing you can look forward to is burning in hell forever, which you fully deserve. His apostasy is complete. He has embraced covenantal curses and will most certainly not be blessed. The heathen embrace haughty pride, self-sufficiency, and thus mock the holy. They scoff at the ways of the righteous, the wise and the holy. They fully and self-consciously set themselves against God and his divine revelation. Men who do not subdue the sinful flesh and stand firm with the righteous end up following the multitude to do evil. It is so sad. And you see all these children sent to public schools and statistics, about 75% of them go apostate by the time they enter college or, or while they're in college. 
The solid Christian emphatically rejects the scoffings of the atheist. But the fool keeps company with those who mock the biblical teachings regarding sin, God, Christ, and salvation. They sit in the seat of the scoffer, and they walk on the Brad path that leads to eternal destruction. They themselves become teachers of poison and blasphemy. They have become doctors of damnation and masters of the doctrine of Satan. His conscience is seared, and he becomes a dogmatic believer in unbelief. He becomes a tool of the devil. He's a walking demon in his thinking. There is no neutrality, beloved. Sanctification is our calling. And if you love Christ, you'll be serious about it. We must remember that the apostate Jews mocked Elijah and the prophets. Isaiah, Jeremiah, they were all treated like dirt. They crucified their Messiah and relentlessly persecuted the apostles and evangelists. The great danger of communing with unbelievers can be seen in the statistics relating to evangelicals who send their children to secular humanistic antichrist state schools. By the time they attend college, I think it was a Gallup poll, 75% are apostate. That's shocking. Now, it's not uncommon for a person to have an unsaved child. But 75%? The preaching in evangelical churches is garbage. And they're indoctrinated five days a week with secular humanism and pro-homosexuality and satanic ethics. And then they get an hour of media, of 45 minutes of terrible mediocre Sunday school and horrible sermons. And it, people are surprised that they grew up in their apostate. The godly man meditates on God's holy word every day. And he keeps company with those who love and praise Jesus Christ. If one wants to be righteous, then walk and talk with the righteous. Sit among those who love the law, who are serious, dedicated Christians. Okay, so that's really very obvious. But it's in the Bible, it needs to be emphasized. And you read your Old Testament and you see what happens when you don't obey that. Second, <clears throat> to, to starve the flesh, we must watch against unlawful lusts or desires. As Solomon says, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the spring or issues of spring the issues of life. Proverbs 4 23. One must saturate one's mind with scripture and God's moral law. Then one, one must watch continuously against all unbiblical attitudes, philosophies, ideas, and ethical standards. Because, you know, sin begins in the mind. You have to control your mind. Sin begins in the heart, so our starving of sin must begin in how we think. James right. James 1, 14 to 15. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Unbiblical thoughts that are conceived in the heart, if not immediately checked and subdued by Scripture, are usually brought forth in the life and conversation. Okay, how, does two, how do two professing Christians get divorced? Well, one of them toys either with adultery or they just simply say, well, I don't want to be married anymore, and they get a divorce. Well, that should be nipped in the bud immediately if some's think, thinking that way, because it's unscriptural. We don't follow our feelings. We don't follow what we want to, may want to do. We obey scripture. And you stop it the moment you start thinking about it. What am I doing thinking about that? I can't do that. Therefore, Peter instructed us to first focus on con controlling the heart. 1 Peter 2, 11. Beloved, I beg you, as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which wage war against your soul. As long as fleshly lusts are allowed to reign in the heart, one cannot remain covenantally faithful. I, I, I worked at this place, and there was a Jamaican professing Christian there. He had served in the church in Jamaica. He was a dedicated, evangelical, but dedicated. 
So he starts hurrying around these American blacks. This Philadelphia. And these American blacks are all, you know, committing adultery every week. And they all have several mistresses. And they start giving him porno magazines and they start mocking him. And, you know, what are you doing just hanging out with your wife, man? You could have ten girls. What are you having one for? Sure enough, the guy completely apostatized and his wife left him. His, he lost his family. What an idiot. Why, do, why would you listen to that? Put the Bible first. Put your emotions down the list. You obey the word of God even if you don't want to. We are not to delight in sin and contemplate how we can sin with our bodies, but rather think about that which is lawful and pleases God. We cannot trust human autonomy because of our flesh. Don't trust yourself. The Solomon says, Proverbs 28, 26, he who trusts his own heart is a fool. And also Proverbs 3, 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. If you're thinking something that contradicts the word of God, you've got a problem. And you need to repent immediately. You know why? Because the word of God is always right. And if you contradict the word of God, you're always wrong. Jeremiah says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? 17.9 Sinful pride in the heart trusts in self. It toys with sin. And thus goes before a fall. One's eyes, feet, and tongue become servants of the filthy, unrestrained heart. Control the heart, and the tongue and hands will follow. The Bible says, Proverbs 11, 2, When pride comes, then comes shame. And also, Proverbs 16, 18, Pride comes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. You don't place yourself above the Word of God. The Word of God is always right. A man full of pride is unwilling to acknowledge his weak areas, and thus he leaves himself open to temptations. David's up there staring at a naked guy's wife, taking a bath. What is he doing up there? He knew it wasn't his wife. It was another man's wife. He should have stopped looking at her immediately. What am I doing? That's not my wife. I'm not allowed to lust after her. David had 15 wives. He had plenty of women to lust after that were lawful, that was good. But he wouldn't do it. He played with it. His pride, he was lifted up. He toyed with it in his mind. Watching the heart involves making sure that our thinking and emotions are in line with Scripture. If we become angry, do we handle the situation biblically and seek reconciliation when possible? There's, anger is not a sin. What's a sin is to blow up or even worse, clam up and then gossip and slander. Do we use a soft answer to turn away wrath? Proverbs 15.1. Do we handle the problem that very day so that the temptation to sin is nipped in the bud? Or do we coddle anger in our heart and then let it turn into hatred, resentment, and thoughts of revenge? Churches are full, often full of gossip and slander because unlawful thoughts are coddled in the mind. And people, passive-aggressive, they, they go after the people by gossiping. I'll, I'll knock them down a peg, I'll gossip, I'll destroy the reputation. And then third, we must studiously avoid all external causes of temptation. One must never deliberately enter into an environment where one's weaknesses are exposed and enticed. This observation is obvious, yet it is violated all the time. The Krishna used to be a drunkard. You have no business going to a bar. You have no business going to a party where they serve alcoholic beverages. You have no business if you go over to your friend's house for dinner telling them, look, I got a real problem with booze. No booze tonight. A fruit punch or something. Young men and women who are married, who are unmarried, <clears throat> Should, engage in, uh, should not engage in unchaperoned dating or place themselves in situations where sexual lusts are stimulated. You don't go hang out at somebody's apartment when nobody's there. You don't place yourselves in temptation. The modern practice of dating 
and making out and petting have been a disaster for young professing Christians. The fornication rates before marriage are sky high in evangelical circles because people are not following biblical principles. The answer for sexual temptations is to find a Christian wife or husband and find satisfaction in the marriage. Someone who used to take drugs should not hang out with people who take or possess drugs. Okay, I was in a very popular band. I was making money. I was on television even. And I left it all behind. I quit. Because drugs were free. Women were free. Every, everything was free. I mean, it was just like there. You're practically worshipped if you're in a good rock band. And that's just not for a Christian. It's just not for a Christian. One must watch against every circumstance that may provoke or stimulate sinful thoughts, words, or actions. And one should be especially cautious about one's weak areas. Satan will attack at the weakest point, hoping to get a victory by causing a Christian to fall flat on his face. If you've got a mighty rope or a mighty chain holding a ship in dock, and it breaks at a single point, the whole ship will be lost. Satan knows that. He attacks you at your weak area. He's not going to go for your strong areas. He knows he's not going to get anywhere. He's not an idiot. He's going to go for the weak areas. Therefore, our weak areas deserve special watchfulness with scriptural reinforcements. One must be in guard against the first motions and movements of temptation. The very moment they occur. So we can have the appropriate biblical response before things get out of control. David, once again, he's such an example. When he saw a beautiful naked woman who was not his wife, he continued to look and he contemplated his lust. And he thought about, I'm going to get her over here. And you know the story. Brought disaster to his house. The outcome was adultery and murder. But Joseph was approached and tempted by a beautiful woman who was not his wife. He was out the door in a split second. He left so fast, she had his coat in, his hand, her, in, his, in her hand. Now, she falsely accused him, but he did the right thing. The response to temptation is, get the heck out of there. Immediately. Don't play footsie with sin. David was lax, careless, complacent, and foolish. He was easy prey for the devil because he did not nip. He did not nip his sinful lust in the bud immediately and emphatically. And once again, remember when he was rebuked by Nathan. You know, the man who had a whole flock and he had to go get his neighbor who only had one lamb. David had many wives. David had beautiful women. David had absolutely no reason to be doing what he was doing. It was totally wicked. And then fourth, in his epistles, Paul makes it abundantly clear that not making provision for the sinful flesh involves replacing unbiblical thinking, speaking, and acting with lawful Godly counterparts, we read the passages um, that talked about the renewing of the mind. We find that in Ephesians, Colossians, and Romans and other places. You're renewing your mind. You're getting your thinking in line with Scripture. The mind is to be progressively renewed as we learn Scripture, and the Holy Spirit applies the moral law and solid Christian doctrine to the heart. The ways of the old man are to be replaced with the new. Old sinful habits are to be replaced by new biblical habits. The moral requires a certain holy biblical lifestyle. The core of society is monogamous heterosexual marriage for the purpose of raising up a godly seed, raising up Christians. I didn't take the time to look up the passage, but there's a great passage in the prophets where God flat out says, yeah, the purpose of Christian... The purpose of your, your covenant people being married is so I can have a godly seed. I want godly children. Sexual activity is restricted to marriage, and divorce is only allowed in, in the case of sexual immorality or abandonment. And if the person's a Christian and they abandon somebody, they're excommunicated, and then they're treated as a heathen, and they're free to remarry. Theft and leeching, on, and, and most marriage and divorce today is, is simply... A remarriage today is simply, I don't like being married to so-and-so, I want to try somebody else. Totally unbiblical. Theft and leeching off the taxpayers through welfare programs is replaced by hard labor for the purpose of godly dominion. 
passing capital down to faithful heirs and helping the poor. A godly man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. He has so much that his children can benefit, and even their children can benefit. And of course, in the Bible, you only leave money to godly children who obey the Bible. In sanctification, our faith is always directed to Jesus Christ and the efficacy of a sacral de sacrificial death and resurrection. That's the foundation, the power for our sanctification. It is for this reason that orthodox doctrine is crucial. The Holy Spirit, which regenerates us, breaks the power of sin and sanctifies us as the spirit of truth. If one does not truly believe in Christ, as he is revealed in the scripture, one does not possess the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is absolutely necessary for your heart to change. That's why we pray for help all the t every day. Without the Spirit, there could be no real sanctification. And this reality is one reason why the sacraments point our faith to the person and work of Christ. And, of course, the preaching and the means of grace. He is the foundation. He's the source of our salvation in the broadest sense of the term. Once again, he is our sanctification and our redemption. The Bible also has a very strong ethical element. The children of Israel were delivered from Egypt so they could do what? Receive and follow the Ten Commandments. Once again, we're saved to follow the Lord Jesus Christ and walk that narrow path and obey the moral law. The habitual keeping of the moral law is repeatedly connected to covenant faithfulness. The law is our standard for sanctification. That's why evangelicalism is so weak, because they dispensationalism, they've jettisoned the law. There's nothing wrong with the law as long as you use it lawfully for what it's meant for. It's not meant to be saved. It's meant as a guide for living to please God. The law requires the rejection of sin and the subduing of the flesh, as well as a lifestyle of positive piety. You put off the old man, you put on the new. Therefore, one must study scripture and memorize passages that deal with our particular problem areas. If you've got a problem area, memorize those passages. Write them on cards. Put them in your pocket. You're tempted. Pull them out. Look at them. No, I'm not going to do this because this is what the Bible says. We replace the negative behavior with a corresponding righteous activity. As Paul says, walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Ephesians 5.16, follow the teaching of the Holy Spirit in Scripture, which is supported by the conviction of the Holy Spirit on your heart. The Holy Spirit illuminates your mind to understand it, gives you a desire to study it, and then it convicts you, saying, hey, change, obey this, and one will not follow the sinful flesh. People are fornicating in Corinth. Paul says, what should you do? Find yourself a wife or a husband and get married and take care of business. He doesn't say, go join a monastery. And then I'll read a passage, and I'm, I'm kind of running out here. Uh, I want to read, this, is this, this principle of putting off and putting on is, is strongly emphasized in Ephesians chapter 4. And Jay Adams, if you study Jay Adams, his whole system of counseling and uh, helping people change is based on these principles of Paul. But you have not, oh, this is a four, twenty and following. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which is created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. And that takes place in regeneration. Therefore, put away lying. Let each of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down in your wrath, nor give place to the devil. And of course, what is the presupposition there? Get, get, it, get reconciliation achieved that very day. Don't let it go to the next day. Do what you got to do to have reconciliation that day. So you won't be tempted to do something stupid. Let him who steals steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give to the, he who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for edification, 
necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you in all malice. And here's the put on, be kind to one another. Tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God and Christ has forgiven you. You see Christians disobeying this all the time. Be kind, be forgiving. We're, we still sin. We're very defective things. We're, yeah, we're saints, but we're defective. We sin, we make mistakes, we do things that are wrong. So we need reconciliation, we need forgiveness. But anyway, we'll stop there, but uh, I wanted to do more, but this is him wrapping up the situation on sanctification that began way back in chapter six. He wraps it up and he gives all the principles of the Christian life in a few short verses, it's beautiful. And uh, we need to take it to heart and we need to apply it to, to ourselves all the time because of that flesh. If you don't apply it, you're just going to go backwards. We should always be moving forwards, growing in knowledge, growing in holiness, growing in our love of Christ. That's our goal. And that's what we must do. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for your holy word. It is amazing. We thank you that uh, you've given us these instructions. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Give us a love of your word. Cause us to be enlightened. Cause us to believe it and obey it. Cause us to apply these principles to our own lives that we would grow in grace and forgive our many shortcomings, our many sins, Lord. For we fall short every day of your perfect standard. In Jesus' name, amen.